team for leading us this morning. Um, we're blessed by these group of people, aren't we? We really are. Okay. Let's just pray and uh, I might echoey to you guys. I'm echoey to me, but that's okay. I mean, I like my si- the sound of my own voice, so I'm just hearing it twice. So that's good. That's good. It'll just perk me up. <laughs> All right. Father God, we just want to come before you. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears, Father God, just to, just to grow in your name, to receive of you, Father God. I pray that you use me despite my many weaknesses, that, that this be about you, Father God. So Jesus, we just give you this time in your name. Amen. Have you ever had it when somebody has said to you that you are the spitting image of a parent? Right? When someone looks at you and goes, oh, that's, I see the father in you. I see that. I see your mother. Oh, just like it. Or maybe a sibling. One of the downsides of when Jen shaved my hair off, right? You may have noticed that the, it is going back, which is nice. But one of the downsides was, was Maddie, her first reaction was, wow, you look like your brother. <laughs> now, if my brother was Brad Pitt, that would be okay. Now, not to say my brother's not bad, he's just not Brad. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, Really? But it's funny how people see that in each other, how you could just take those, those likenesses of a parent, whether it be in looks or often in attributes of personality. You know, sometimes I catch myself doing something and going, oh, I'm turning into my father. <laughs> Especially when it comes to jokes. I think I'm funny. And I say something, and I laugh, and Jim's like, that's what your father does. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, Actually, it's funny. It's not always like you look like someone in your family. When I started here, the amount of people that said, you look like Ryan Wood. And I had obviously never met Ryan Wood. And, so, and I'm texting Ryan Wood because we're planning the, um, the snaz at that time. And so I'm texting him, and I'm thinking, well, I'll just say it. Hey, people think I look like you. I hope you're good looking. <laughs> and he replied, well, now I hope you're good looking. And I was pleased when I met him. I'm thinking, phew, he's, you know, he's 10 years older. I'd be very happy if I looked like Ryan Wood in 10 years' time. But um, that's a kind of weird thing to say in a sermon. Anyway. <laughs> but often we, we see that, especially in our family, the, the positive and, and maybe not so positive. The great thing about being a pastor is you get to hear about all the saints that were um, the part of this church. And so I've met with people, and, and people would talk of, um, a Gordy Mitchell, for example, someone who I'd never had the privilege of meeting, but yet people talk about this man of leadership and passion for music and passion for being in sports, in the church, and things like this. And then you meet Cam. So obviously I not met Gordy Mitchell, but then I see Cam Mitchell, I'm thinking, wow, you can see that personality and attributes, right, in, in that person. I mean, Cam, who, a godly man leading us in worship, passionate for his family, passionate in his faith, and passionate in sports, so much so that he would injure himself, right, in this place, wearing very flimsy shoes, nothing to do with the church building or anything, just to make that very clear. He was wearing, I think, Heidi's shoes, but that's another thing. <laughs> but, but you can hear that the, of the positives of what is passed down through generations. Of, you can get to know someone that you've never met because you can see it in that other person that that has been passed down through. But then also, too often we focus on the the negative attributes. You you hear people saying of, maybe they struggle with something. Maybe it's alcohol, for example. And they say, well, my my father struggled with that. And and his father struggled with that. I mean, you look through in the Old Testament of, of the time of prayer that the Israelites would have And last week I talked about Nehemiah. Nehemiah prayed a prayer of confession and forgiveness for things that happened hundreds of years before him. And generational sin, I mean, that's a real thing. 
Things get passed through the line. And there is, I firmly believe it, power in breakage of that through prayer, through confession, that that can be broken. But we see too often we focus on the negatives of what is being passed through. And this morning, you can put the slide on, Joe, if, if it's working. There we go, perfect. This morning, we're starting this series of going through the articles of faith. And the first one is about God, the triune God. And how in Genesis, right from the beginning, it, it talks about how we are made, us humans, are made in the image and likeness of God, who is our heavenly Father. Scripture talks about God being our heavenly Father. For example, 1 John talks of, but as many as received him, to them he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. He is our heavenly Father, and Scripture says we humans have been made in his image and his likeness. What does that look like? I mean, it's easy to look in a mirror and say, man, I'm turning into my father. But what does it look like and live out like to be in the image and likeness of God, our heavenly father? Let's look first at who God is. We believe in, as the church of Nazarene, as Christians, we believe in God. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We see that in Scripture. We see that right at the beginning of Scripture. Let's uh, see if this guy works. If not, Joe, you're going to have to use your finger. Press that thing. There we go. You get your money's worth of Joe today. Right at the beginning of, of Scripture, we see the Trinity. In the beginning, God. Not just randomness, not nothingness, but God. God's there to begin things. Created all heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So even in the first couple of verses, we're seeing God the Father, God the Spirit, there, present. And then as we go through the creation story, And he gets to create in us people. God says, let us make man. Other translations say mankind, humans. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. God's not just talking to himself there. The Trinity is part of this. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Even in creation, is shown to be there. And so we believe in this God. And so, who is God? Let's have a look at some characteristics, some of the personalities of God. And then what we're going to do is say, okay, let's not just look at the theory of that. How does that practically look for people who are sat in here today singing and praising, of seeing the light, of knowing God, what does that look like for us to be in the image and likeness of God? It's still not working. Oh, there you go. So who is God in the Bible? Here's a few things, seven things. I thought I'd keep it with the whole Genesis seven days. Anyway, never mind. Number one, God is the creator. It's not a fluke. It wasn't randomness. God purposefully created all things. Number two, God is love. God created all types of love. He is love. When we think of the love that you have for your spouse, the love that you have for your child, and this is the beautiful thing, and I always recall this, is that moment I held Maddie in my arms for that first time. This gooey kind of blob thing, crying and pooping and doing all this weird stuff that I'm thinking, wow, I didn't have that responsibility two days ago. Holding this thing and this emotion within me of love. 
And at that point, I'm thinking, I would do anything. I put my life on the line for this gooey blob. Do we think that's just a random fluke chemical reaction that suddenly just happens? Or is this a gift that God gives us to love? God is love. God is just. The good thing about being God is he doesn't have to answer to anybody. You read Job, and Job is complaining and complaining. Fair enough. You read what happens to Job, you're like, oh, fair enough. I'm kind of on your side there a little bit, Job. And then God comes on the scene, and he's like, you put the stars into place? Were you there when I created all things? No? Then pipe down, Job. God is just. He's God. The problem with one of the issues that I think we have today is people are thinking, well, if I'm going to believe in God, then he has to fit into my expectations of a God. If God was real, he would be like this. If God was real, he would be like this. There wouldn't be this. There wouldn't be that. We make God fit into our plans. We kind of get that a bit, if not very, wrong. He is God. He is just. God is a refuge. Read through the Psalms. I know how David had just to run to God and just to find rest in God. God was always there. God was always present. He didn't get bored of him. He didn't get tired of of David when he would cry to him. God was present. God is present. God is a refuge. God is strength. That Red Sea looked like no one could get through that. God made a way. There was power. There was strength that moved the mountains, that moved that sea. God is compassion. God is a provider. The compassion to listen to Moses as he pleaded on behalf of these Israelites to listen to that plea. Compassion for us human beings, love, that even though we mess up, the, the compassion that he has is, I'm going to send my own son for you. A provider, whether it be manna or different types of food, whether it be the breath that we can have today, God is a provider. And a God that as we read in Scripture, Zephaniah 3.17, as I love this passage, that in the back end of that passage, it, it talks of how God rejoices over you with songs of praise. He's looking at you, his masterpiece, his beauty, his creation. He's looking on you with joy, with praise. Here's the thing. We've been singing some great songs, been led beautifully, but we do not create worship. We're not that good. God is, is saying to you, I'm rejoicing over you right now. I delight in you. This is a God that purposely and wonderfully, fearfully, as it's in the Psalms, you've been fearfully and wonderfully created. And God is rejoicing over you. So these are just some of the characteristics and personalities of God. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to flip it and say, okay, if those are characteristics of God, and if it says in Scripture that we have to be in His image and in His likeness, what does that play out like? What does that look like for us today? Let's have a go at that. First one, God the Creator. If we are in His image and likeness, He has given us the ability to be creative. He has given you unique personality. He has given each and every one of us unique passions, skills. He says, be creative. Use them in worship, in life. Here's the thing. When When we think about people's passions, too often we keep them for the secular world. And then we kind of put people in a box when it comes to church and, and Christianity of, well, if you've got, if you've got talent, you, you're in this section. You're either preaching or singing or you're going to be at the back or you're going to do this or that. 
why, why don't we just allow God, the Creator, who gives us this ability to create and be creative in our worship, lead us? You may have a passion for, I think I said it last week, for clothes, for, for fashion. I'm thinking, oh, we can't mix that in church. Absolutely. Why not open, you know, start one of those rooms and put in a lot of beautiful clothes, a boutique type thing, so when people come in looking for clothes banks, they're not just rummaging through clothes in a box. You know, these people are coming off the street, perhaps, who are feeling shame, maybe passed on through their generations, and, and of coming into this situation. How awesome it would be if they could come into a room that's got beautifully designed clothes and, and beautifully designed room and say, hey, we love you, we appreciate you. My passion is designing clothes or is organizing this kind of stuff. There you go. That's just one example of building stuff or writing stuff or painting stuff for God's glory. You may go to the mountains and see some beauty and you want to take some photos of it. So that when you look back at that, it's just reminding you of the beauty that is nature and creation. Be creative. What is your passions? What, what gets you going? Don't just keep that for side things. Use it to give God glory. Use it to express how grateful you are for who He is in worship and in life. That's what that looks like. God is love. Enjoy love. Pursue love. It's a good thing. Now, I'm not just talking about the lovey-dovey love, but that's a good thing to pursue too. I mean, those of you who have been married 20, 30 plus years, continue to pursue that love of your spouse. That's a good thing. For those of you who are still looking for that first love, pursue it in the right way. You don't have to go on a Tinder for that. Some of you are like... That's okay, that's good. Pursue love. Whether it be with that spouse, whether it be with your child, whether it be with your neighbor, I'm definitely not talking about the lovey-dovey love there, I'm talking about maybe just build a friendship there, okay? Just make that clear. But we've been created to love, so pursue that. Enjoy that love. God is just, therefore he is the ultimate judge. So, chill out. We don't have the job to be the final judge. I think us Christians have given ourselves a job title that was never given to us when we start judging others. When we see somebody in their lifestyle, or their, what they look like, where they live, or whatever it might be, like, oh, go to hell terrible, they're damned. Show them the love of Christ. Listen to them. Journey with them. But we have this thing of, oh, that person's in, that person's out. That's not our job. So chill out, because that would be a terrible job. I would not want that job. I would not want that job. Take the plank out of our eye and focus on our growth and journey in Christ. But what we do have the responsibility of judging is in our own actions. We have been given a conviction by the Holy Spirit of what is of God, what is right, and what is not. You can judge and go, am I living this holiness life? Is some of my actions a light, a pursuing Christ, reflecting Christ in my life? We, we can have that discernment. We've, got, we've, we've been given that gift to go, no, this is not of God. This is of God. God is the ultimate judge. But allow our judgment of our actions to be of Him, to be holy, to be pleasing of God, who is the ultimate judge. People need to know Jesus. People need to know that there is a hope, there is a Savior. And shouting at them pointing fingers at them, looking away at them, I don't believe it's the best tool. God is a refuge. So let's be a refuge to those in the world. And here's the thing. We can look at the physicalities of being a refuge, and that's great. Of We need to be a refuge. We need to be a shelter. 
But how about in your workplace being a refuge for people? Here's an, ex here's an example. My dad, in the, his workplace, he would tell the stories of how when they were in the office place and all the guys, there was many men working, were working, there would be all this banter going on. And he said the conversations were pretty vulgar at times, pretty low at times, demeaning at times. And in fact, they all knew dad was a Christian and so quite often would mock dad for being a Christian. But he said he always found it interesting that whenever he was one-on-one -on -one with them, that they wouldn't be that way. They would almost kind of relax a little bit not have to play up to the other guys, that they could just be themselves and quite often would ask him questions about his faith. You know, and I think people seek that. Too often trying to please other people or play up to a role that is expected of them. How about if we be that light that they go, man, I can just be with you and not feel judged. I could be with you and, and just be heard. I could just be with you and just be me. Just rest. That's a good thing to be, to be a refuge for other people, that when they're with you, they don't think they have to play up to anything, but just be themselves. God is strength. Here's the great thing about this one. He's in you. God, the Holy Spirit, dwells in you. So when we talk about strength, we need to humble ourselves and say, God, I need you. Scripture tells us that we can do all things through Christ who gives us that strength. What does that look like? That means when we have situations, whether it be going into a room and that you're really uncomfortable in or an environment that you're really uncomfortable with or being with people that you're not comfortable with, whatever that environment may look like that you go, oh, I don't want to go there because I'm just really uncomfortable. Maybe it's an interview. Maybe it's a family din dinner. Whatever it might look like that makes you go, oh, I don't want to do that. that you can answer that and go, no, I can do that. Why? Because even though I am weak, even though I, I in myself go, no way, I have got God who is strength in me, and he says in his word that I can do all things. I can go into this meeting. I can go into this room. I can do whatever it is that I feel led to do, this calling, this passion it might be, that's prevented you from maybe being expressive and creative, this fear, I can do this because I have got Christ in me. Here's the thing when we think about strength, or maybe here's the thing, actually, we, th we think about when looking at temptations and and maybe things that we want to stop doing, but we feel like we can't do. A response we say is, if God wanted me to do this, or if God wanted me not to do this, he would just stop it. He would just not make me do it. Here's the thing about strength. If you look at a bodybuilder, or maybe one of those, you know, a weightlifter, when you see them at the Olympics or whatever, lifting those weights, and they're lifting it up, we would say, man, that guy, that woman, they're strong. And they're lifting it above their head. You're like, wow, they have the strength to lift whatever that weight was. Strength is not easy. They don't just go there, walk up and go, whoop, one, two. They're there, they look like they're like pushing something out, you know, they're there, they're shaking, their face is all red, they're, you know, screaming away as they're trying to lift that up. They're saying, wow, they're strong, but strength is not easy, does not come easy. It, it comes with perseverance. It comes through trying. It comes through learning from maybe past failures. Strength comes from allowing God to work in you to be able to say no to that temptation. To go, even though you may lose sleep doing it, even though you go, wow, that was tough, good. God's given you that strength. It's not going to be easy. But maybe we need to persevere in that. God is strength. He's in you. God is, the compa is compassionate and he's a provider. So be compassionate. 
Look at the world around you. Look at the hurt that we see. Whether it be global or local or in your family, how can I help that person? How can I be a listener? How can I be a friend? This is where we be church. The church in action. I think the world will sit up and listen when, when they see the church, not just being people that come together on a Sunday, which is great, but be a people that say, how can we be of the likeness of God who is compassionate? How can we be of the likeness of God who is a provider in this local community, in this world? Even though it will be difficult, but we need his strength to do that. The church in action is in the likeness of God. And then we look at this last one, a God that rejoices over us. We are created to worship. We've been created to respond in our lives in worship. He is the ultimate one who kicks things off. All we are doing is responding. We are responding to the fact that he loves you this much, so much so that he sent his son to die for you. Here's the thing. We too often look in the mirror and we think of negatives. We look in the mirror and go, you know, I'm turning into this person or that person. Oh, I wish I was better at this. You look at other people and what they do in their work or their creativity and go, oh, I wish I could do that. Always the negativity. Always the putting down. Rather, we should be looking at God and saying, God is love. God is strength. God is saying, I delight in you. I love you. That you could do all things in me that we should look at ourselves in that reflection, which is the cross, and look at, wow, that's a God who loves me so much, that delights in me so much, that he would send his son to die for me. I'm going to clothe myself in that reflection. I'm going to walk in that light, rather than in the light that the world puts on me, or my family put on me, or more, more often, I put on me, or negativity. That's not of God. We listen too much to the enemy of lies, of destruction. Rather than listening to the truth of what God says about you. So here's my challenge for us this week. Because it's all good looking at the theory of it. And I've been challenging myself on this. It's like that example of when you're saying to somebody, fall back, I'll catch you. We've all seen those things done. When you actually take part in that exercise, it's actually quite scary. Because even though, oh yeah, in theory I know. But then when you actually do it, it's like, but what if? When it comes to faith, quite often we're good at the talking and saying, oh yeah, I know God delights in me. Oh, I know I get strength from him. Think about the week coming up. Are there areas in your life that you could clothe yourself in the likeness of God. Maybe you've got something coming up that even though you say about strength, are there areas in life coming up that go, do you know what? That is going to be uncomfortable, but I'm going to step into that. God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to step into that because you are in me. Maybe you've just been listening to negativity in your life and heard that pass through generations. You won't amount to anything. You'll just be like this person or that person. Maybe this week, anytime you have that negative thought or speak negative about yourself, reject it. Stop yourself. Say, no, that's not who Christ made me to be. That's not who God made me to be. He delights in me. He loves me. He is strength. He is compassion. To stop ourselves and go, no, I don't want to just have the theory in my head and clap to that. I want to be able to come on a Sunday and celebrate it because I've been experiencing that in my life. I've been experiencing 
the life of living in the, in the likeness, in the image of God the Almighty in me this week. That would be a pretty cool week. So go for it. And that's what I'm challenging myself on, so let me know how it goes. Talk to each other. Maybe keep each other accountable. Are there things that you keep beating yourself up on? Okay, I'm not going to accept that. Or maybe somebody keeps talking to you down. Maybe this week it's being bold and strength and saying, no, I am not that failure. Because I've got Christ in me. Our growth and pursuit in holiness. Be holy. Because God is holy. Be love because God is love. Be creative because God is the creator. Respond to this. Don't let it just be theory. Let's pray. Let's, let's pray and we're going to finish with a, um, they said it was, they told me the song, I can't remember, but they told me it was an uplifting one, so we're going to have an uplifting finish. Whatever it is, it'll be good. Give it extra beat. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Thank you, God, that you create us in your image, in your likeness. You are holy. You are love. You are joy. You are strength. You are mighty. You are compassionate. You are forgiving. Father, there are so many. We could just keep going through and just encourage us, lead us, Father God, just to be in your likeness, to not accept the rubbish that we get told, often by ourselves, to reject those and look to you and to look at your reflection and to look at what you have done for us, which is the cross, which is the death and resurrection of Jesus for us so that we can have life that's everlasting, that we can be bold, that we can walk freely, we can go into those uncomfortable environments this week knowing that we have a mighty God that's in us. So Jesus, we ask for that. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, we just ask for these, these traits, these goodnesses, We reject those negative thoughts. We reject those things that maybe have been passed down through generations that we've maybe just accepted. There are lies that you don't want us to hold on to. And maybe they run deep, but Father, we ask for that strength to just cut them off, to say no to those lies. And say yes to you, who is a God that listens, a God that is with us, a God that cares, a God that rejoices in us. Help us, Father God, just to grow in your name as a church, to be a church of love and compassion, a church that reflects the image and likeness so that all will see, whether it be our children, whether it be this neighborhood, whether it be whoever it is, see that while these people are more than just singing about it, more than just talking about it, they are living, embracing people who who just show that light, Father God. Help us in our workplace be a refuge to others. That we seek you for refuge in our life. That others can seek refuge in us. That they can experience you through us, Father God. That all can know that you are a God that is love and truth. Jesus, we thank you. Praise you.